Hello, my name is John Shimp. And I'm Liam Osborne. And today we are going to be taking an in-depth look at Frankinus Gaforius's Practica Musicae. So before we begin, I want to ask what the hardest thing about writing music is. Is it finding that gorgeous, fabulous melody? Is it writing down the rhythms and uh, finding a real good chordal structure underneath? Is it having some sort of interesting middle part that you can nicely bridge between the beginning and the end? So thinking about uh, how we write music, that's really going to guide you into this text. And so we also want to introduce this quote. For Aristotle had good reason to state that it is futile to accomplish with greater means what can be done with fewer. And we're hoping that this quote and, these, and this question would provide a lens and a framework with which you can use to look through this presentation. And hopefully as we go through, it will be further expanded upon. So the treatise itself was written between the years 1481 and 1483 across two cities in Italy, Monticelli and Bergamo. Gafurius's biographer, Pantab Pantaleon Meleguli, excuse me, mentioned that uh, it was originally started in Monticelli, but that there was some controversy as to whether or not uh, portions of it were written in Bergamo or if it was finished in Bergamo. But the official publication date is September 30th, 1496 in Milan, Italy. And this treatise is a part of a larger group of works known as the Trilogia Gaffuriana. So the original copies, those that were printed uh, in Milano, are listed here. And this is directly from the Nism, which is uh, pretty much the uh, laid out exact location of all of the original copies in both country, library, and city. So um, as you can go through here, you can see the second from the bottom is the United States. We have seven copies, one of which resides in Boston, and uh, there's another one which resides in the Library of Congress. If you go up to Great Britain, you can see that uh, in the third entry, which is the London British Museum, you can see that they actually have two copies of the specific text. So the editions, there were five editions that were printed between 1496 and 1512. So five and 16 year period. That's a lot, right? It costs an incredible amount of money to print a book now. So imagine how much it probably would have costed to do it then. And you also kind of can uh, put into perspective that the people who printed the book and the book binders were not the same people. So this just shows that this was the uh, theory textbook of its time, right? It was the most influential musical writing. Uh, this is why we had so many copies that were needed. And it also shows that these were not just thrown up on the shelf, right? We actively use this teachers, composers, and students read this text to gain something from it. So a little background on Frankinus Gaffurius. According to Bonnie J. Blackburn, he was an Italian music theorist, composer, and choir master, most notably at St. Maria Maggiore's Basilica in Bergamo, which contributes to the idea that some of the treaties may have been written in that city. He was the first music theorist of his time to have a large number of published works, and he established a legacy for centuries after his death, as we are still talking about him today. Present authorities consist of Clement A. Miller, who wrote the English translation of uh, the treatise with which this project is largely based on, James Haar, who wrote a chapter on the frontispiece of Gaforius's treatise, and Bonnie J. Blackburn, who wrote uh, a portion of a biography on Gaforius's life. So the actual text is broken up into four books. The entirety is explaining musical composition and how to notate it and how to do it, really. Uh, so book one is plain song, book two is natural music, three is contrapuntal procedure, and book four is his uh, individual theory of proportions. So book one talks about two main topics. Firstly, we have the formation and explanation of a diatonic scale through intervals and interval relationships. Um, as you can see in the top right hand corner, we have uh, two notes uh, displayed by Oot and Ray. Uh, this explains a relationship of whole steps and half steps or whole tones and semitones. And it is the same distance up as it is down, which was used to help the singer understand how the notes uh, fit together. But what's really interesting about this book is we see this translation of thought. There are three main people involved in this. We have the Greeks, Guido d'Arezzo, and Gaforius. So the Greeks understood scales in terms of uh, a letter-based system. 
But it wasn't until we got to Guido that we had, as you see in the bottom right hand corner, we started to use Soulfish. Guido was one that said, we have Oot, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, and La. And so he bases this on a, a hexachordal system or a system of six tones. As you see in the next photograph, what we have is, a, a, again, a hexachordal system in groups of, or in a group of seven. So we see this relationship, as you can see with this first grouping, we have Oot, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La. And to the group that is adjacent to it, next La, we have Mi, and then we have Fa. And so what's happening here is, is Gafurius is saying that uh, this half-step relationship between Mi and Fa is starting to contribute to the idea that we are moving into an eight note scale, which is what we understand today. He furthermore goes and touches upon uh, the eight tones or church modes as, as we would call them today. And he called them the tones because of their relationships of whole tones and semitones. And he explains those by uh, consonant fourths, fifths, octaves. So for example, a consonant fourth would consist of two whole steps and one a uh, half step or two whole tones and one semitone. So U to Re is a whole tone, Re Mi is a whole tone, and Mi through to Fa is a, a half step or a semitone. But what's interesting about this concept, as we see in the next picture, this is the frontispiece of Gaforius's treatise. And James Tarr wrote a, a chapter explaining this book, uh, explaining this, this image, excuse me. And he's quoted as saying, uh, and there are those who think the modes themselves to be participants of celestial harmony, for they believe that the star of the sun rules Dorian, that of Mars, however, is ascribed to Phrygian, to Jupiter Lydian, and to Saturn Mixolydian. So Gephorius is not only giving us a theoretical understanding of, of these modes and how they fit in that context, but he's also talking about them conceptually on a larger scale, on a more universal scale, on how these scales, on how music contributes to the universe itself, which I think is a very interesting point that he goes to touch on. As we move into book two, we start to move into uh, note lengths. So as you can see in the top right hand corner, we have a breath and directly below that a double breath. And as you can see, it has a tail on the right hand side, which is equivalent to the four sides of a breath, as well as we see uh, syllable length. And um, uh, excuse me, Gafurius quotes uh, grammarian Diomedes, who says, since one precedes two, a short syllable precedes a long syllable, since two is twice one. So what we're seeing through the book is this idea of mathematical proportion through notes, through rhythm. Uh, in, the, in the bottom right-hand corner, we have notated rests, which also respectively represent twice the length of specific notes, because what we're doing is we're notating pauses. And as we get more towards a metric system, of notation, we're starting to notate silence in music. We also have the Tempus Perfectum, uh, which as we understand as perfect divisions of, of beats um, are, are notes that uh, divide into three. So we have uh, the brev being divided by three semi brevs, as well as this idea of uh, poetic and rhythmic meter. Um, and so he believed that uh, poetic and rhythmic meter was synonymous because they dealt with this idea of arsis and thesis or rise and fall. He quotes a man named Betis, who held the belief that rhythm shouldn't be considered metrically, but based on the number of syllables determined by ear. But Gafurius actually disagrees in that he feels that rhythm cannot exist without meter because metered rhythm provides a guide to sound and movement of music. We also see the dot for the first time, which adds value to the note preceding it, which then leads into the ideas and concepts of alteration, which is twice the value of a note, or a diminution, which is cutting those values in half, as well as syncopation. He touches on this idea of tactus. Um, and what, what he understood this to be was a regular temporal unit or meter that was synonymous with a man breathing regularly. And this is where we first see the ideas of uh, the metronome and that uh, meter and timing was synonymous to the consistency of a heart rate or of a, of a man's heart be beating regularly. Um, but what's What's interesting about this is that it's not very reliable because at that time, we, you know, what, what uh, dictates a man breathing regularly? Is it 67 beats per minute, 88? Um, what is, the, what is the, the number? It is extremely innovative because it starts with Gafurius and we further build upon this idea as we go through the years of music. So book three is specifically about 
counter counterpoint and counterpunctual procedure. So basically goes through and lists the eight rules of counterpoint in addition to, you know, false counterpoint and what not to be doing with counterpoint. So um, there's not too much you can really talk about besides going to the fact that it, they're just the eight basic rules of counterpoint. I mean, you know, ending with a perfect consonant, beginning with a perfect consonant. Um, parallel fits, parallel octaves are bad. You know, voices should move in contrary motion. Don't cross the voices. Just the basics of part writing, really. Book four is where it gets really interesting. So this is his original theory on uh, rhythmic proportion. And he goes through and he explains, first he explains the subdivision of a beat and beat by beat relationships. So therefore talking about tuplets, you know, triplets, pentuplets, then tuplets for nine. Um, the right way to fit those notes into a beat so that if you have something in four four and on the fourth beat you have a triplet, you know how to divide that triplet equally and fairly so that all three of those notes fit nicely into one beat. Um, then we start to move uh, away from uh, prolation and perfect and imperfect prolation and we start to use numbers instead of symbols, in, except for one case, where we have our symbols today of the C with slash through or C for common time. We understand that to be in imperfect relation, and that's where that C comes through. However, it's his theory on uh, tempo and proportion that really is what's original here. So if you look at this proportion, two over three, now what does this proportion actually mean? Uh, it's not two thirds. Uh, here's a, a perfect example. If you have a measure of 12 8 and next to it following is a measure of 4 4, okay? If you're going to go through and count the eight notes, specifically the eight notes in both of those measures, the first measure 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? The next measure 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 8. In the 12 8, as notated, there are uh, 12 8 notes. In the 4-4, four, four, there's only eight eighth notes. If they both are actually going to take up the same amount of time, which eighth notes have to go faster? Well, it would be the 12-8 bar, because you're fitting three eighth notes into a place where you now fit two. So if we are going to go from a measure of 12 to a measure of 4-4, four, four, we can't just do it. We have to notate something between that bar line and what would be notated in this case would be three over two, because where you now have had three, you now have to have two, and talking about the eighth notes in this case. So um, as was discussed earlier, it's the idea of if there is a, a note or an explanation on what you should be doing in a text or an explanatory text, it means that someone was doing it the wrong way. And so the, uh, the composer or author felt the need to correct it. So that's what brings us to this next quote here is, nevertheless, I can hardly tolerate the use of one number to show a proportion. For we've already stated that a proportion cannot be formed without two numbers. So basically what composers were doing was, in this, in this case from 12, 8 to 4, 4, they just put 3. Or they would just put 2. And those numbers mean two very different things. So you have to have two numbers to explain what's actually going on. So we now come to the question of why does this matter? And so anybody who spoke anything about music theory had to know who Gaforius was. We see that his legacy and his theory practices lasted well over 300 years after his treatises were written. And if people didn't know uh, who Gaforius was or what he wrote about, they did not have any credibility in talking about the subject. So it's the same idea of um, geometry. Like you can't teach or talk about geometry without talking about the uh, Pythagorean theorem. Uh, Pythagoras, it's just that same idea of he set the basic and just the groundwork, built the, the foundation for the general core minimum of what was required of knowledge within their respective field. This is what the forest does with his uh, practical music. Head. And so we just want to leave you with this final notion that Gaforius writes in his treatise, the perfection of anything is the end. We want to thank you very much for your time and we hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Goodbye. Thank you.